talking about daily wind accelerations in mountain valleys in western Montana. And for the people who grew up in Florida and never left Florida, these are mountains, and that's snow. They're very beautiful. If you ever have a chance to see them, you should. Um, I took this picture last summer when I visited, uh, during one of these wind events, actually. So the, these wind events, um, after looking, starting looking at them, they occurred mostly in the mid-afternoons, uh, clear summer days. Uh, I try to stay away from the storms because that can bring a whole different account why these wind events occur. Um, they are very, they can be powerful, they cause power outages, and it can be very dangerous for uh, motorists. Um, so my idea of what I wanted to do was to see what's causing these events, and are they forecastable? Now you're probably wondering how me living in Florida got interested in something other than Montana. Well, I like to travel with my family, and we're big uh, motorcycle riders. So we were out in Montana last summer, and in our 44-foot RV, and then on our motorcycles, on these very narrow roads, not much of a shoulder. So when these wind events would occur unexpectedly to us, we could easily get blown across the road and very, very dangerous. So it made me more interested in why these are occurring. So mainly I'm looking at, this is uh, Western Montana, and I'm focusing mainly on the city of Missoula and their location. They have a National Weather Service located there, so I was able to get very reliable data from them. Uh, with Montana being very low population, they don't have many other city options for this type of terrain. And to zoom, zoom in more, so here's Missoula, here's the National Weather Service, and all of this is Rocky Mountains, and this is a giant valley that Missoula is located in. So looking from one of the higher peaks in those mountains, looking southeast into the valley, and then there's the National Weather Service. So it's kind of trapped in between these mountains, which can help drive these wind events. So in order to look, try to figure out when these were occurring and how strong they were, I went on to Weather Underground. They had a very nice detailed history of each day. And I was able to look at these graphs here the top one is for temperature and dew point. It just shows the change in temperature and dew point throughout the day. The next one is for pressure, how the pressure rises and drops throughout the day. The middle one is the winds. So I was looking specifically for these type of situations where you have zero mile an hour here at 10 o'clock in the morning, local time. And then by noon, you have about 20 miles per hour winds with gusts up to 35. So, and then the very bottom one is wind direction, and I didn't focus too much on that. I just made sure that these are coming from uh, the northwest region near the mountains. So, possible explanations for these wind events. I had, a, after looking at the data and looking at how the temperature, the dew point, the wind speed changes and pressure changes, I started trying to come up with some possible ideas of what these events could be. The first one. I looked into what Chinook winds, and I'm going to go more into detail on each of these in a minute. The next one was catabatic winds, and then the last one was temperature inversions breaking and causing uh, mixing of higher winds from the upper layers in the atmosphere. So the first one is Chinook winds, and what these are is air is driven into the uh, west side of the mountains, and then the air is forced upward because it has nowhere else to go once it hits the mountains. And starts, it starts to precipitate and gets, starts losing its moisture. So once it reaches the top, it, the momentum drives it down the other side, bringing warm, drier air with high winds into the valley on the other side. So I thought, maybe this is a possibility. Then I went, so I looked at all 10 cases that I looked at specifically for this and calculated the average temperature and dew point changes in each one. And the average temperature change was only 2.37 degrees Celsius, which is, which matches with the daily heating just from the sun on a clear day, warming the surface. So that ruled out the Chinook winds, even though it does bring in drier air with the dew point dropping, which means drier air being brought in, the temperature rise itself was not significant enough to consider these Chinook winds, so those were ruled out. Next ones are the catabatic winds. These are more common in the winter. Um, if, you, if people are aware of uh, Yellowstone National Park, 
This is more common in that region where there's a high plateau, usually snow covered, and the, pres the pressure difference between the higher and lower pressure um, drives these winds down, down the mountains into valleys. And it does show a pressure change. However, because of it needing a plateau, um, kind of rules out this situation in this area of Montana. If, but these catabatic winds are still important to look at because they're, they're, their winds are very high, but not uh, for this region. So the last one is temperature inversions. So here I have two scooties, uh, both from the University of Wyoming uh, archive data, for Great Falls, Montana. Now, the main reason I just use these is because the National Weather Service in Missoula does not launch their own Renaissance weather balloons. So I cannot get SKUTs specific for, for Missoula. So these are more for explanation purposes because the terrain in Great Falls is completely different than the uh, terrain in Missoula. But to explain what a temperature immersion is, is on the left you have your dew point. And on the right, you have your temperature and how they change as you go up into the atmosphere. Right here is the temperature version at the surface. And the main thing to know about these is that since the temperature is warming as it goes up higher, that means that colder air at the surface is being trapped. Cold air can't rise without it being forced up. So it always has to be warmer air going to cooler air. So with that warm layer here, that air is trapped. So it does not allow any mixing. And this, so this is the SKU-T from in the morning. This is a 6 a.m. local time because they're launched all at the same time across the world. And then this is the 0100 Zulu or uh, 6 p.m. local time. And you can see that this inversion is gone. It is now a straight line, which means that it is returned to the normal idiot, uh, dry idiobat decrease of the temperature as you go up. So this allows this upper air to start mixing with the surface, which, which allows momentum to drive higher winds down towards the surface and allow an increase in the winds. And this situation occurs commonly everywhere, just some areas not as strong. We see these here in Florida during the winter mostly. Uh, this is the same one that I just showed you from Montana in the summer. And then this one is from Cape Canaveral in the winter with an inversion right here. So identical situations. And then when you look at the next QT plotted, you have, once again, that inversion gone. And then on this one, the inversion gone, allowing mixing to occur. Ours typically occur early in the mornings in the winters, just from the uh, heating from the sun. So the next question is, are these forecasted? So this is a radar that I got from the um, from National Climate Climate Data Center. So what you'll see are these greens start moving in. The colors represent different wind speeds. So you can see as these greens come in to the radar, and then it becomes an orange as it leaves the radar. So the greens represent winds going into the radar, and orange leaving the radar. And that's in this small location is where the radar is. So you can actually see these winds come in from as long as the radar has vision on these without mountains blocking the way. You can actually see these winds come through the radar. So they are visible. So different options of how these can be forecast. The first one I mentioned before is the weather balloons. Um, they retrieve data uh, in the atmosphere, send back down, and then skew T diagrams can be plotted. And you can look at those and see the inversions and all the different wind speeds. The problem is that they do cost a lot of money and to launch each one. And so they're only launched in limited sites worldwide. So this idea is not the more ideal situation. So the next idea is wind and temperature profilers. This picture on the right is a uh, wind profiler and RAS profiler. The wind profiler is a 404 megahertz wind profiler. It sends a signal up and just retrieves the wind levels at different uh, layers in the, different heights in the atmosphere. And then retrieves those back so now you have the different wind speeds at different layers. The rest profilers, which are these little towers on the corners, they do the same thing but for temperature. So now you have 
the basic information you need in order to forecast these is the winds <coughs> at the different heights and the temperatures at different heights so you can locate these inversions. And these are just a one-time install, and you don't have to keep sending up uh, weather balloons, and you can get this data whenever you want. You don't have to wait for the rest of the world. So, conclusion, these wind events do occur daily, almost daily. You have about one to two day in between at most. Um, they can occur in other places, not just Montana. They do occur like here and other places. But some areas it's just not as prominent and as strong. Um, and it's just caused by mixing of upper and lower uh, layers in the atmosphere, allowing winds to increase. Uh, and near the surface and decrease in the higher level because the higher level has higher winds due to the friction. And using the wind and temperature profilers, you can actually predict these to allow people who might not be necessarily used to the area and know about these wind events and they can be more aware throughout their day. So these are my acknowledgments, Professor Parks and our GSA Jeff for their help and opinions and advice. Uh, Dave Noble and Chris Gibson from the National Weather Service in, in Missoula. I had some contact with them because I was a little confused at one point and they helped me steer into some ideas. Um, my parents for their support and giving the opportunity to make these amazing trips possible. And my sister and relatives for all their support for all of this. <laughs> Any questions? Mm -hmm. Did you have any days where you had uh, convection around and there might have been dry microbursts, or are these pretty much clear all around? Clear all around. Um, I try to avoid any type of convection because I know that can create a whole different situation. Um, these generally occurred with maybe one or two clouds at most of the sky. So these are bright and sunny, no convection. Yeah, to um, look at the time of the day when the mixing occurred. We have all these events, right? So right. it can vary from day to day and depending on the sounding. And um, I didn't look, I, I looked into the time to see if there was a consistent time of when these occurred, and they were generally midday. As far as getting specific layered data, I wasn't able to get it, especially mainly because there was no data resources. But you did show a nice time series. Yeah, that that is um, just hourly data recorded from the National Weather Service at the surface. So all of that is the surface data. So I was able to see zero to 20 to 25 mile per hour changes within a couple of hours. At least. Just to follow up back to that, uh, back to that data uh, point, how many of these wind profiles and the temperature profilers uh, systems are out there now, and what's the do you have any idea? And do you have any idea what the cost is? Uh, I'm not uh, quite. We're looking around those systems that you showed. Um, I'm not quite sure on the exact price of how much these cost. Um, a lot of locations do have them, just because of their convenience, and not every site can have weather balloons because of their con constant maintenance. But um, it's the more feasible option if they really are interested in trying to forecast these. All right, we'll stop it right there. If you have any more questions for Joe, you can catch him.